Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. Turn over in your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter number 9. The book of Matthew, chapter number 9. And I'd like to speak a little while this morning for, for just a few minutes on... Uh, uh, verse number 16 and 17, verse 16 and 17, but keep your Bibles open because we'll say a few things about the chapter in itself. But notice if you will, here's the, here's the verse. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out. The bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, I'd like to speak this morning on the subject of, well, the overall subject would be religious patchwork. Religious patchwork, because we've got a lot of patchwork going on. Uh, but I want to take these verses right here and speak for a little while and, and maybe try to make some application to our situation in our life and the scriptures uh, for us. Uh, our Lord frequently used the idea of double parables or double truths in order to contrast things. Or compare things, oftentimes to show the opposition between one thing and another. Uh, for instance, he talked about salt and light. Talked about mustard seed and then leaven in bread. And he talked about hidden treasures. And then he spoke on the heels of that of the pearl of great price. And so there was oftentimes contrast. Uh, he talked about the sower. And the different soils, you know, uh, if for us. Then he, then oh, just right, just right across, he talked about the wheat and the tares. And so he used these things in contrast for us. He talks here about the old garment and the new garment and the old wine skins and the new wine skins. And, uh, so you've got an outward and an inward aspect in these parables. Brought to light. And uh, this parable here, this pair of parables right here, it presents an outward and an inward respect as far as the coming of our Lord Jesus to this earth. Uh, the effects of it. The results of it. And what we experience by it. Uh, so I want to speak about that for just a little while. This old garment and the new uh, garment for a minute. And, and there are three angles that I want to take in approaching this thing, all right? Three angles. The first one, I want to talk about it for just a minute, dispensationally. Now, what that means is that God at different times worked with mankind, mankind in different ways. There are a number of dispensations in the Bible. For instance, we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. They did not have any idea about this dispensation in the Old Testament. And so uh, God made this mystery known to the Apostle Paul, and Paul declares it to us. And so uh, uh, dispensationally, how does this... How does this fit into the scheme of things? I think you can see that in this gospel. Now, Matthew's gospel, of course, you realize and you know and you've been taught that Matthew's gospel is a kingdom gospel. It's written by a Jew and its approach is to the Jews. And so uh, Matthew, Matthew in his book, it's got that Jewish flavor all over it. Now, if you don't like Jewish flavor, you, the book of Matthew is not going to mean much to you. But the Jewish flavor is all over the book of Matthew. When you come to chapter number 9, there are what we would understand as some type, typological types uh, illustrated, the, illustrate uh, the dispensation that, that that of the Jews. Uh, there's some types here, some, some, some typical meanings here. 
For instance, the, in those first eight verses of Matthew chapter number nine, you've got the story of Jesus coming to Capernaum and he's going to heal a man of palsy. Now, uh, here's what we call the healing of the paralytic, okay? And so Jesus manifests himself in this story as Jehovah, who has the right both to heal and to forgive sin. And uh, he's able to forgive the sin of this individual and to raise him up. Uh, when he does do that, down there, he, he well, it says, uh, well, let's, let, let me read it to you. And he entered into the ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought unto him a man sick of palsy, lying on the bed. Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, and this come right on the heels of Jesus, this man getting healed. Behold, it said, certain of the scribes, now these, these are Jews, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. Now you do remember that Jesus came into his own, that is his own people, and his own people received him not. They didn't receive him. They wouldn't have nothing to do with him. And constantly all the way through his earthly ministry, the Jews were throwing stones and rocks at him and trying to stumble him, uh, trip him up and everything. And here they, they say, this man's blasphemy. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, for whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know, and here he goes, the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up thy bed and walk, and go to thine house. And he rose, departed to his house. Now, here in these verses right here, the Lord magnifies himself as being God, the only one that can forgive sin, you know. And he gives them a picture illustration of what it means uh, when he raised up that paralytic, paralytic man. Um, he's able to give new life. Only God can do that. He's able to say, rise up, you know. And one of these days, we're going to have a resurrection body. We're coming out of the ground. He's going to say, rise up again. I mean, that, that, that is also true. But in verse number six, he said, the son of man on earth. Now, he is, he is, while he is on this earth, a misused, uh, miracle worker. But these miracle working things that he does is not for the Gentiles, though the Gentiles did receive some benefit from them. The miracles that Christ did was to manifest himself to the Jews, his people so that they could point back to the Old Testament, the scriptures and prophecies, and say, that's him. And uh, they missed it all together. And here the scribes and the Pharisees, they find fault with the Lord, and they should have known him, but they didn't. But one of these days, there is going to be a restoration of the Jewish nation. For right now, Israel is in blindness. Israel is in darkness. They do not know the Lord. They didn't see him there in the book of Matthew when he was offered to them. They did not see him in the book of Acts and then God finally turned to the Gentiles. But here, one of these days, there's going to be a, there's going to be a restoration. And according to, uh, Micah chapter number seven, that whole nation He's going to see who Christ really is. And uh, he's going to blot out their transgressions and he's going to raise them up. And they'll enter into the millennial with glory and with uh, the Lord. And so that's, that's a truth there. Now what did the Son of Man do in his humiliation when he came to this earth? He came... And, of course, he was displaying to the Jews who he was, but they missed it. And he turned to the Gentiles. And uh, here's an old boy who is lame. He can't do anything for himself. And the Lord says, rise up and walk. That's what he did for me and you. And uh, we bless the Lord for that. But uh, he's going to do that thing for the, for the Jews after a while. 
And so dispensationally, there is a lesson here for us in these old garments. Uh, in verse number 9, you go a little farther in verse number 9, and he calls a Jew, Matthew. He calls Matthew to be a disciple. Here he is going to take a Jew and preach to the Gentiles. That's exactly what's going on with those that are saved by the grace of God out of the Jewish nation. They're preaching during the, during the tribulation period. Uh, he's going to use the Jews to take and preach the everlasting gospel, uh, across the world. And so, uh, you have a picture here dispensationally. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to work down to this thing, getting ahead of myself. I, I feel like Brother Dwight, you know, you just have to, you only got but so long to get it out. But, um, uh, here you, you, you've got a man who is a traitor in the eyes of his people and he's called to follow Christ and he's going to be a, uh, help carry the gospel to the Gentiles. He goes home and Jesus goes home. He, he eats with sinners and, uh, in verse number 10, he declares his mission to the world. And, uh, uh, there's a woman over here in verse number 18 who, while the Lord is going to the Jewish to raise this daughter up of Jairus, there's a woman that touches the hem of his garment. Here's a picture of the church right here. Here's a picture there. Now, now both the ruler and the little girl and the, or everything, they're, they're as helpless as they can be. And the woman is helpless as she can be. Uh, but she interrupts that mission of our Lord going to raise up that little girl. And she touches the hem of his garment. And that's where, that's, that's the state of the church right now. As far dispensationally as we can, as we can understand it, uh, the Lord came to declare to the Jews, salvation first came to the Jew, isn't that right? And the word of God was given to the Jew, and they had every kind of advantage in the world, but they rejected Christ. On his way to set up a millennial kingdom, though, there was a touch by a little woman that was in infirmity. And done spin all, and boy, she's in bad shape, and, uh, the Lord healed her, you know. Virtue went out from him and healed her. That's a picture of the church, dispensationally. That's where we are right now. Now he's going to still go on to Jerry's house and raise up his daughter. And the millennial is going to be a reality, and the Jewish nation is going to come to light after a while. Right now, uh, she, she, she's still laying over there, uh, and folks are pleading for her. Now, that brings me to verse 16. Verse 16 says, No man putteth a piece of new cloth. The new cloth represents for us a new dispensation. A new time in which men are, de- God is dealing with men. And it's what we call the church age, the day of grace, the, the hour of grace. And uh, this is an inward reality in the life of individuals rather than the outward observance of rituals and rules and things of that nature and conformity. Uh, Jesus is the new and the living way, and we recognize that. And it's Christ who is the Lamb of God. All of Israel, they only had an old way, and they had... Uh, sacrificial lambs, Jesus himself came to be the Lamb of God and is the Lamb of God. Judaism cannot repair Christianity. Here it is, the old garment, Judaism, the new garment, the church. It cannot repair Christianity. And Christianity cannot repair Judaism. These are two entirely different systems. Uh, one is old and one is new. The old garment of Judaism is worn out. It served its purpose. And uh, now the new era has risen. Let me give you a for instance, all right? Just last week, someone came came in and visited me, and they were a Sabbatarian. Now, what that means is, it means that they're saved by grace, but they say you've got to observe Saturday, the Sabbath, as uh, being of the law, from the law, the test of your love for God. Now, i tell you what that did. That made me go back and realize how important it is that we be loosed 
from every bondage and every law of the Old Testament. It's a complete different system and economy. In fact, I'll tell you how completely different it is, and I'll probably have to preach on this one day, but that old economy, if you bring anything out of that old economy and make it new, in the, put in a new economy, you destroy both of them. It, God did not intend for the law. Somebody said, well, I'm saved, you know, and all I got to do is just, you know, keep the Ten Commandments and, and I, everything. No, no, it doesn't have one thing to do with the old economy. The Christian experience, the Christian life is altogether new. Grace is completely different than law. And one of the reasons, and you can search around, I've been searching for the last couple of three or four days. Uh, one of the reasons God did not give us a day of the week as a command to observe was because in the Old Testament, he gave them a, a Sabbath day. That was the law. The new day is dealing with grace. It's grace. And uh, you don't give laws in grace. It's grace. Now, here's the here. You now we talk. We talk about Sunday. You know, the first day of the week. The reason we we meet on Sunday, and of course, I think there's several reasons in there. How do I get off on this? I'm 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 not even talking about this part. But but one of the re the reasons we meet on Sunday, uh, I think you can see it all the way all the way back. But but Israel worked. Six days a week, and they rested on the Sabbath. Y'all, in that, in that way it was? They worked, then they rested. No work. None. No activity. None. The church is, was, well, Christ came out on the first day of the week, or the eighth day, the day of new beginnings out of the, out of the grave. Isn't that, isn't that right? And so, so all the work, seven days worth has been done. That's the Old Testament. And now we serve, we, we're active, we, we, we started a new beginning on the eighth day. They worked six days so they could rest. We're resting in that resurrected Christ and we're serving from then on out. Do y'all see what I'm talking about? And there's a shift altogether. I'll, I'll, I'll preach on that sometime. But I'm trying to say the old cloth cannot be repaired by, by the church. Judaism was not intended to be repaired by the church. That old garment has been worn out. It has served its purpose. There's a new era, new dispensation uh, going on right now. And um, the gospel of our Lord Jesus, that's completely new. It was not present other than just picture form in the Old Testament. And so uh, everything's new about the church. It's a new idea, a new mystery that's come on the scene. They didn't know about it whatsoever in the Old Testament. So the old and the new right there. The new conception about the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of God is not political. It is not, it is not of the law. That's what they thought it was in the Old Testament. That's why they looked for a king to give them some deliverance and to set them free, you know, when they were there, cut them loose from Rome. They felt like it was a political kingdom, but that's not the kingdom of God. And uh, the, it's, it's different. The, the experience is different. You're talking about law over here. You're talking about love over here. You know. You're talking about obedience to a prescribed certain measure of definite things, points. But over here, it's a little more stringent and it deals with the spirit and not just with the flesh. And so, uh, Judaism, this, this idea here about, this idea here about, about, uh, dispensationally, I think you can see that in that teaching right there. I think it applies to the individual. The individual, the old garment, that is your reputation and your righteousness as an old man before you got saved, uh, uh, you don't just tack Jesus onto it. There's got to be a completely new, radical, religious, not religious, but, but righteousness uh, declared on your behalf. When a person gets saved, he does, he, he, we got an old body, 
But we have a, we have been spiritually resurrected and made anew. And old things pass away and behold, all things become new. Uh, now that old garment, it's just not enough. It's not good enough. Uh, that old garment was something we got from Adam, our daddy, our great, great, great granddaddy, Adam. And uh, Adam sinned against the Lord. And we were born in the similitude of Adam. That means we were born sinners. And so uh, that's just not good enough. It's wore out. Uh, uh, oak leaves and fig leaves ain't, ain't good enough any longer. you got to have some kind of garment that will cover your nakedness and your ugliness. Am I right? And so, so the old is not good enough for the individual. Uh, everything's become new for us and it's a good garment. The new garment's a, a good garment. Has nothing to do with the old garment. Uh, the old garment, uh, somebody said it needed mending, but mending won't do it any good. Sin tore it to shreds. Some of y'all now, not all of you, but some of you can remember when mama used to darn your socks. You know, and she took, boy, you didn't just buy a new pair of socks all the time. You got some, it's Christmas time and stuff like that. Now, us younger folks might not know a whole lot about that, but I've heard stories about like some of y'all, had not that right? And uh, they darned them socks. But I have had a couple of pair of breeches that, that mama darned and darned and darned because I liked them so much until finally the fiber was too weak to hold it together. I want to say the fiber of man's old righteousness is just too weak to hold together in the presence of God. And so there has to be a, a discarding of one so that we can get the other. Uh, why is righteousness compared to a garment? Well, I think several reasons. One is because it covers our nakedness. You needed a covering. We're not streakers. Huh? No, no, friend. Man was naked before God and in a shameful state before God. We needed something to cover us. And oak leaves wasn't good enough. Pine needles is not good enough. You know. We needed a new garment. And that new garment is the righteousness of Christ, His blood. And it's completely different. So, so righteousness is compared to a garment because it covers nakedness. It covers shame. Uh, it's useful. Protects us from the elements of the world. You know, I'd hate to go through this life with no protection. I'm glad. Thank God. Now I got a reverence uniform on this morning. And, uh, uh, you know, I praise God for it. Wouldn't it be sad to face the elements of cold, sleet, rain, snow, and those kind of things with no garment? And so it is. It'd be terrible to have to face sin and the world, flesh and the devil, and all the circumstances of life without the garment of the righteousness, not to mention the judgment of God, naked, shame, and without any protection. Oh, the garment of the righteousness of Christ and the blood of Christ protects us. Oh, we need a garment. And um, I might just add this. That new garment that God gave you when you got saved, that, that new garment that God put on you and put on me when we got saved is maybe disrespectful in a sense in this world, but it's very respected in heaven. I mean, thank God when you get there, you're not going to have to stand before God unclothed. In Christ, you're the admiration of the heavens. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. And uh, I'm so I'm grateful. That's why it's a garment. Well, the new cloth, the righteousness of Christ, is given freely by the grace of God, and it's appropriated by faith in his complete work. Christ is the believer's righteousness. Now the problem today is that many people are trying to mend the flaws of the old life. If I can turn over a few new leaves, change a few bad habits, you know, start a few things that would be a little more beneficial. So they'll quit cussing. They'll quit kicking the dog. They'll quit drinking as much. They'll start coming to church once in a while, you know, and they'll start trying to 
Straighten up the outward man is all it's doing. Trying to pacify that in their heart. You cannot be satisfied from that which was yesterday. You've got to be satisfied with that which is going on in your life now through the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you should never thirst. I believe that, don't y'all? I believe that those that which he gave is wells flowing up inside of you. And thank God for that. It's continual. Uh, so it's not Pat's work. You can't just tack Christ on or tack, tack the gospel on or tack the church on or just start becoming religious. It just won't work. It'll destroy both of them. You know what you end up when you leave here having done done that? You end up, folks, that would, boy, that, that man, that, it ain't real what that man's got, what that woman's got. And you find yourself to be a, a, a hypocrite to what is real. And so it won't do. Pat's work, Pat's work won't do as far as an individual is concerned. Uh, in fact, filthy rags is all we have to offer. And uh, uh, that's a leper's rags. That's all your righteousness is anyway. It's a leper's rags. But thank God there's a new garment. Fresh, new, clean. Better than being washed with free, free breeze. Is that what it is? Free breeze makes your stuff clean. Well, whatever it is. But it, it, whatever it is, uh, thank God for the new righteousness there is in Christ. And so it's got a dispensational application. It has got a, an individual application. But then I just want to give this to you and I'll quit. There's a devotional application to this parable. This idea of old and new, which can't be mixed together. Uh, uh, John's disciples... This is John the Baptist. His disciples are asking the Lord. Now, it may be that John's in prison at this time, or maybe that John's already already gone. Maybe that he's already been beheaded. I don't know. But at any rate, his disciples are by themselves, and they're left left to ask questions. And so they come to him, and they they ask the question. They say to him, "Oh." Why is it that your disciples, John's disciples, they they fast and they pray? Now, fasting, of course, and pray, they, they, those were signs of mourning, mourning and sorrow. And they may have been experiencing some sorrow at that time. And they said, why is it that John's disciples fast and they pray, but your disciples aren't fasting and praying? And Jesus said, well, how in the world can they do it? They're the bridegroom's with them. You don't get sad while the bridegroom is there, you know. You're happy whenever you got the bride and the bridegroom there. It's a happy event. Well, devotionally speaking, there's a proper place and a proper time and a proper setting for things that are suitable. There is a time to mourn. There is a time to be sorrowful. They were sorrowful up to the coming of Christ. They were fasting and praying up to the coming of Christ. But when Jesus came, he changed things around. He's the bridegroom. It's not time to be sorrowful. It's not time to be mourning. Not time to be fasting. And he says, now, these, these disciples I've got are, are just children entering into, into a new era. They're not fully matured yet. They'll learn when the time comes to fast or to be sorrowful. He said, but they can't do it right now. They're rejoicing in me right now. And I'll say to you, uh, you can't expect folks that just get in to know everything that you know. Isn't that true? Somehow or another, we think that Christians, people get saved, then automatically they, they just know everything that they're supposed to know. Of all the crazy things in the whole wide world I have heard about. I hope they know more than you anyhow. <laughs> I hope they know a little more than me, but I don't want them to tell me that. Say amen right there. Now does it, 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 it kind of, and this is just a little pet, oh good, nine I can't even tell you. But, but it is a little pet peeve with me. Folks that get in and already know everything, that's a little bothersome. You know, a little bothersome. You're a babe in Christ. How old you are, and you still don't know things are right until after you get saved, and it takes time to grow and mature in the Lord. And so, just devotionally speaking, you can't take an, uh, a piece of old garment 
We sow something new to it without tearing it all to pieces. Then these new converts here, uh, right right here, there, he explains that difference. Their garment uh, is going to wax hold in time and, and they'll have need of repair. Well, the new, fresh experiences that you have with the Lord daily and weekly and monthly and yearly, those new experiences, that's new manna. And uh, that which you lived on up till that time, it waxes old. Uh, you know, you've heard, uh, and I believe you say, I believe your, your, te your testimony ought to be fresh and new. Don't y'all believe that? It ought to be fresh and alive and vital. I'll, I'll never forget the day Jesus saved me that night. I don't want to forget anything about those early uh, steps with Christ, and years with Christ. But I'm not living on that. That's old manna. Uh, there's already worms in that. So many what? I, I'm getting out daily and getting some of this new manna and new experiences and fresh things. I love to hear what God did for you yesterday, but I like to hear what God did for you today. And you ought to, you ought to not, you ought not just discard all that yesterday. Uh, that's that that's a blessed, you know. But I'm looking for what the Lord has to do. Those old that old garment, it won't, it it can't hold up to what the new garment is. In the old skins, try to pour some of these new experiences in the old skins, and it'll bust a bottle, you know. And so it's new. The new experience brings you up into a newer, fresher, uh, lively relationship. And so I, I realize that. Uh, dispensationally, there is a truth here for us. Individually or personally, there's a truth here for us. And then devotionally, there's a tr truth here for us. And so uh, uh, you can't mix the law with grace. You'd become a disgrace to you if you try to. And uh, uh, individually, uh, you can't stand before God in your own righteousness. You must be robed with the righteousness of Christ. And in your daily experience, devotionally, you can't live off of what you got yesterday. You've got to move on forward and see Christ anew today. Does that, does that make sense to you? I mean, these are just a few little thoughts that have come to my heart as I was reading this parable, and it's there. I believe it's really there. All right? Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family, and I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm.